vision, what you find is that in one vision, you have the logic of geopolitics, which is very territorializing, very state-centric, draws on all other narratives of nationalism, populism, and so on. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the second vision, you find a more benign geoeconomics. I, I, I'm deliberately using this word benign geoeconomics because I'll come to more aggressive understandings of geoeconomics later, where the idea is that you're looking at more liberal uh, understanding. You're talking about trade flows, you're looking about commercial flows, you're talking about new technologies, uh, and so on. So one vision is territorializing, the other one is deterritorializing. Now, what you find is entanglement. These logics are entangled. So, for example, Belt and Road, you find more emphasis on deterritorializing narratives, whereas in South China Sea, you find just the opposite, where there is, there is this territorialization of flows, and, 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 and you talk about more about choke points and, and all kinds of cartographic anxieties that are associated with it. So you have these entangled logics. How do we disentangle them? Because not only as academics, I think, but also from the policy perspective, how do we disentangle these increasingly entangled logics? And one logic which uh, we are not talking so much, which I think is important when we are talking about connectivity projects, we are talking about competing connectivity, say, for example, including Belt and Road, is the logic of ecology and ecosystems. And sometimes we forget that all these narratives and all these discussions in which, in which we are all engaged are happening right at a moment which geologists will call the Anthropocene. We live in an era of global warming, climate change, and there are other uh, similar challenges. So the question which I would like to pose in a very provocative manner is China the heartland power of the 21st century? Because I want to start with classical geopolitics. And the reason I want to start with classical geopolitics is that we have a uh, good deal of discussion even in China today about Mahan, about the concept of sea power, maritime power. Makinda uh, is not only um, very popular, but it's popular in countries like Russia where geopolitics was always being seen in a very negative light. And Halford J. Mackinder was certainly not one of the favorite geopoliticians. And today you have Russian Vuma Committee on Geopolitics. All these classical geopolitical writings are get, getting translated. Uh, now, why, why is this happening? I mean, uh, that, that also becomes a very important question. Why is Mahan discussed so much in China? Uh, what is there in Mahan's... Um, classical theories to which I will come uh, very, very shortly. So this is one. The second is that uh, I also found a mention of this term, great games, uh, the old ones and the new ones. Um, and we know that when we look at these uh, narratives of great games, we should not dismiss them outrightly. Even if we don't disagree, we, even if we don't agree with the, uh, the, the uh, great game notion, we should not dismiss them for the simple reason that there are strategic communities and there are strategic thinkers with influence, considerable influence on policy making who believe in these great games. And perhaps, perhaps, some great game is also happening in the sense that uh, there is this competition over influence. Now, what does influence mean in today's context? Uh, how would you define power, particularly when you talk about knowledge economy? I mean, these are, these are the questions which again would demand attention. Now, one thing is there that even in India, when we look at our own strategic community and thinkers, and you would find that there are occasional references to Euro-Asian geopolitics. There are occasional references to, to Mackinder and Mahan. And I think, as Colin Gray says, and I agree with him on this point, that when we ask ourselves the question, why countries behave the way they do, uh, why China is pushing this belt and road and, and what is... One thing is very clear that these apparently economic narratives or economic initiatives are anchored in a country's geopolitical vision. Uh, they are anchored in, in the narratives of exceptionalism, moral exceptionalism, 
they are anchored in the narratives of manifest destiny. And sometimes we don't realize as students of geopolitics and international relations that emotions, for example, in China there is this occasional reference, not occasional, frequent reference to the century of humiliation, that emotions, pride, hurt, sense of hurt, the sense of not being taken seriously, which we hear very often here, uh, these also play a very important role. But in addition to this, the meta-geographies of international relations also played an important role. If a country perceives itself as a land power, you will see that that image will reflect in a strategic thinking, its strategic policy. And if a country thinks of itself as a sea power, it will have a very different way of... And therefore, it's no, no surprise that uh, India, unlike China, because in China you have that centrality. China is seen as the center, which is not the case here in Jambudvipa. I mean, I don't have to, to go into the details. You find that it becomes very difficult for strategic thinkers and geopolitical thinkers in India to put all its eggs, as they say, in the basket of Indo-Pacific, something we can discuss later. Because I have always um, argued in my presentations that for example, what about Indo-Mediterranean? What about Indo-Antarctic, looking south and looking at the islands? So this distinctive political culture I'm quoting here, which substantially determines national style in foreign and military affairs, is the product of a distinctive national historical experience. And that distinctive historical experience, no less distinctive, a blend of national geographical conditions. So I'll, I think as we go through the slides, this point should become more clear. I want to start, well, it's a long history of geopolitics, I don't want to burden you with that, but I want to start with what John Agnew calls the first phase, which was civilizational geopolitics, which was responsible for the drawing up of cultural boundaries between Europe and Asia, and then he comes to naturalized geopolitics. So the term geopolitics was coined, as we all know, in 1899, and it was very much influenced by the organic theory of state, state seen as some kind of a uh, living uh, organism. Rudolf Schellian was the one, a Swedish political scientist, who coined this term. His guru, Friedrich Ratzel, talked about Lebensraum, living space. And he said, and you can see this racist intervention here, what John Hobson calls scientific racism, a great territory invites to bold expansion, a small engenders a faint-hearted huddling of the population. The conflict of nations are in great part only struggle for territory. So if a country's strategic community believes in Lebanon's realm and the living space and also influenced by some kind of an organic theory of state, it's not a surprise that you may find some parts of the world ocean being increasingly turned into some kind of maritime territories. Haushofer, he's the one who coined the word Indo-Pacific as you will see a little later, this German geopolitician. So when we use the word Indo-Pacific, it's sometimes it's useful to be reminded of the person who used it and the context in which he used it. He said, what is the ultimate goal of geopolitics? It is the fairer and better distribution of the world's living space and of control over that space, a fairer distribution made in accordance with the numbers of each group and their capacity for achievement. And he also said space governs Man mankind's history. This is how he defined Indo-Pacific when talking about these pan regions. He said, it is the dense Indo-Pacific Indo concentration of humanity and cultural empire of India and China, which geographically sheltered behind the protective wheel of offshore island arcs. Now, here comes a geostrategic turn, which I think is very important for our, for our deliberations. And it starts in 1904, when Halford Mackinder delivered his, uh, his address to the Royal Geographical Society and also wrote that article in Geographical Journal. And why 1904 uh, becomes important, why I'm starting from that point, because I think there are some similarities between 1904 and the times in which we all live today. Because these are the moments of interregnum when you find yourself confronted with both remarkable change at the same time significant continuity. And you find that the meta-geographies of international relations are undergoing a change. 
something which you will see in case of China, for example. How China, I will argue later, how China is trying to push beyond, go beyond these uh, geopolitical territorial uh, binaries, land power and sea power. But the anxiety was, in Mackinder's mind, and we can't forget Mackinder because you can't forget Carson. And we know, we know what was the what were the implications of Carsonian geostrategic thinking, and also Olive Caro. I'll come to him a little later. This was the anxiety about the closing of the world. It was the geopolitics of fear and cartographic anxieties. And Mackinder said, we shall again have to deal with a closed system that is worldwide in scope, every explosion of social forces, instead of being dissipated in the surrounding space and barbaric chaos, will be sharply re echoed from the far side of the globe, and the weak elements in European societies will be shattered in consequence. The West was faced with East. That was the kind of feeling that was developing. He drew this map, and Mackinder's Heartland theory is very interesting for us, because you will see a reference that he will make in the last paragraph of his article, which was published in the Geographical Journal, to which I'll come very shortly, this is the map, and here you see an expression called the natural seeds of power. Now, we know that for a very long time, Euro-Asia remained a very strategic theater, the strategic geographies, and today, I'm not saying that Euro-Asian strategic geography has declined in importance, but you also have now the maritime, the shift, Starts with pivot to Asia, pivot to maritime Asia, and of course, then you will have all these narratives of Indo-Pacific. Now, when he talked about the pivot, pivot area, and talked about inner marginal crescent, and then he talked about the outer or insular crescent, Mackinder divided the history into three epochs, pre-Columbian before 1500, Columbian 1500 to 1900, and post-Columbian 1900 onwards. And 1900, he finds this shift taking place, Siberian, Trans-Siberian Railways, so please mark technology, science intervention, and resources, resource geopolitics comes into play, the direction. And please remember at that time, Arctic was frozen, something which has changed dramatically. So that has also then opened up, as I will argue later, a new frontier for China's economic engagement. That is how I will conclude my presentation. Now, when he was talking about this, and we all know his dictum, who rules East Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, who rules the world island commands the world. So he's talking about geopolitics of domination, pursuit of primacy. He is offering a geographical causation behind geopolitical histories. And then he makes a point, which at that time did not receive the kind of attention which is receiving now. Because he said, in the last paragraph, while talking about the possible occupants of the heartland, natural seats of power, Mackinder said, were the Chinese, for instance, organized by the Japanese, were to overthrow the Russian Empire and conquer its territory, they might constitute the yellow peril to world's freedom, unquote. Now, those uh, who admire Mackinder, and there are many of them all over the world, there are societies, there are schools of thought, have suddenly sort of started talking about this last paragraph of his article and say, look, one belt, one road is what? So this is how, you know, you, you, you draw upon a classical geopolitical theory to, to, to argue that if you look at the continental dimensions and the maritime dimensions of the belt and road, you can see how China, in a very unconventional manner, is going to dominate these strategic geographies, both on land and at sea. Mahan, Alfred Thir Mahan, who talked about the sea power, very much debated in Asia today, including our own country here, India, and also China, talked about the sea power, shipbone commerce, and said communications are the most important single element in strategy, political, or military. And he goes on, sea lanes of communications, we all know how important they have become, both to Indo-Pacific narrative and to the Belt and Road. But then he said, again China figures, China may burst her barriers eastward as well as westward toward the Pacific as well as towards the European continent by its nearness to the scene and by the determined animosity to the Chinese movement with close contact seems to inspire the United States with its Pacific coast is naturally indicted as the proper guardian for this most important position. Nicholas J. Spikeman, 
who gave this concept of rim land and argued that it is only by controlling the rim land that you will be able to contain the heartland power, also said, again, the great threat to U.S. security has been the possibility that the rimland regions of the Euro-Asian landmass would be dominated by a single unbalanced power in the post-war world, China would emerge as the dominant power in the Far East. Now, these narratives, these anxieties are coming from a particular location. And locations matter. That's my point. Whosoever controls the rim lands of Eurasia, that is Western Europe, the Pacific Rim and the Middle East, would contain any emerging heartland power, Spikeman said. And then he said, Indo-Pacific. What is Indo-Pacific according, according to him? Circumferential maritime highway, which links this whole area together in terms of sea power. Now, before I take you to Olive Caro very quickly, let me also introduce one more perspective, which I think is useful and that is called the perspective of critical geopolitics. So you have classical geopolitical narratives and you have a critical geopolitical perspective. The focus of critical geopolitics, according to Jared Rutol, is on exposing the plays of power involved in grand geopolitical schemes. Fundamental to this process is the power of certain national security elites to represent the nat nature and defining the dilemmas of international politics in particular ways. And John Agnew says that when you are looking at these Indo-Pacific narratives and so on, let us also be reminded of the fact that since the Cold War, there has been no single geopolitical template that assigns meaning to world politics. So how meaningful and how helpful is this template called Indo-Pacific? I will not comment on that. And I will just raise the question and leave it at that. But what is important is Hobson's very insightful intervention in his book, the Eurocentric conception of world politics. And the reason I'm referring to John Hobson is because locations matter and we have a different location in the post-colonial, post-partition South Asia. Neither Mackinder nor Mahan granted Eastern Agency a progressive role in making either of the West or of the world politics. Eastern people were cast with the negative stereotype or trope of barbaric activism, some kind of a predatory Eastern Agency contributing nothing positive either to progressive civilization or to world order and constituting merely the harbingers of an anarchic new world disorder. Behind the universalistic veneer of geopolitics among nations lurked the sound and fury of race struggles. Their racist idiom, the barbarians are coming, the barbarians are coming. Now, we also had strategic thinkers who talked about China, who talked about great game, and one name that deserves mention is Olive Carroll. And Olive Carroll, I will not go into the details, but if you read uh, this particular book called The Future of the Great Game, where there is a very detailed analysis of Carroll's thinking, his argument was that the great games will never end. Great games will continue. And the new great game will be where India and China will be the key players. And he goes to South China Sea, he talks about Vietnam, he talks about the possibility of a strategic alliance between Vietnam and India and so on. Uh, so there is, there is also in this, uh, in this uh, with, with Olive Caro, a very important engagement. Now if you look at his seven power circles that he drew with the help of his uh, you know, colleagues, Atlantic, Europe, Central Landmass, Indian Ocean, Africa, Pacific, and America. This, was, this is how he divided and of course, how can we forget K.M. Panikar, you know, uh, who said, who talked about the steel ring and said, a system of forward bases at or near the Indian Ocean choke points, including the Bay of Bengal and its Singapore, Ceylon, Mauritius, so on and so on. So I will very brief reference here. Now my, my next point is, next question is, how do we account for the revival and return of classical geopolitical theories? Now the point is that they, the return is taking place in new context. The contexts now have changed. And what is the importance of that needs to be explored. But one thing is there, that when geopolitics was misused by the German school of geopolitik, the person who brought it back was Henry Kissinger. And the reason I want to sort of share this quotation with you is to show that how in the United States thinking, geopolitical vision, you have this very important binary of the land power and the sea power. And if 
that binary is now changing particularly with regard to china you can see the reason behind so much of being weight so much of weight being put behind the notion of indo pacific from our location what should it mean is is a different question he said in the post cold war world american idealism needs the leaven of geopolitical analysis to find its way through the maze of geopolitical complexities geopolitically america is an island off the shore of the large landmass of euro asia sea power whose resources and populations far exceed those of the united states students of geopolitics and history would argue however that russia regardless of who governs it sits astride the territory halford mckinder called the geopolitical heartland and is the heir to one of the most potent imperial traditions now comes my i'm now going towards the concluding part and uh, given the fact that i don't have much of time at my disposal pardon me if i sort of rush you through uh, some of these arguments now the point is that i talked about benign geoeconomics now let me talk about more aggressive understandings of what geoeconomics is all about now the book that before i come to more recent uh, narratives we know that edward lutwak was the one who talked about geoeconomics and said the methods of commerce are displacing military methods with disposable capital in lieu of firepower civil innovation in lieu of military technical advancement and market penetrations in lieu of garrisons and bases now more recently we have come across a narrative which comes from the book war by other means geoeconomics and statecraft where blackwell and harris have said geoeconomics is the use of economic instruments to promote and defend national interests and to produce beneficial geopolitical results and the effects of other nations economic actions on a country's geopolitical goals and according to them the master of geoeconomics is china and they would want united states to learn lessons from china and how you could use geoeconomics as a tool of geopolitics now as far as lutwak is concerned i disagree with him on the on the issue that geoeconomics is replacing geopolitics and i also have some issue with blackwell and harris because i have a feeling that when you say geo geoeconomics to be used as a tool of geopolitics what you are ignoring is what matthew spark says double vision and what is this double vision according to matthew spark geopolitics and geoeconomics are ent actually entangled with each other today in the form of a double vision a double vision that maps the divergent economic imperatives in capitalism towards territorial fixing and geographical expansion in a distortive way that repeatedly divides the world into distinct zones zones of geopolitical conflict on the one side that is south china sea for example and spaces of geoeconomic peace on the other so peaceful rise harmonious rise and so on so as we look at three chinas economic china social china and political china when we are trying to understand the economic engagements of china my argument this morning is that we have to really deconstruct this double vision and that poses a challenge before both academics and 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 policy makers because it is only by disentangling and deconstruction that you would be able to devise your responses to what are called the economic engagements and the larger geopolitical context and motives that that go with them so return of indo pacific again you can see another challenge that comes when we talk about economic engagements because the geo strategic context and the meta geographies of international relations are also changing so what used to be the pacific command now is the indo pacific command i will not sort of uh, spend more time uh, on this except draw your attention to raise one question because in the pacific is being discussed uh, today by us from one well, that question is is indo pacific a region if it is a region it is a super region and super regions have their own problems number 2 if indo pacific is indian ocean and pacific together then your earlier distinctions of inside and outside run into trouble because if you use the indian ocean as a as a construct or, or as a region then you can talk about inside outside china becomes an outsider say for example uh, 
But if you're talking about Indo-Pacific, then the, those who are external now are also very much internal. And if Indo-Pacific is strategic geography, which in my, in my view it is, then it is a set of strategic geography. There's not one strategic geography. And as an example, look at 2017 foreign policy white paper of Australia. Look at national security strategy document of the United States, where it says, I quote, a geopolitical competition between free and repressive visions of world order is taking place in the Indo-Pacific region. The region which stretches from the west coast of India to the western shores of the United States represents the most populous and economically dynamic part of the world. The U.S. interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific extends back to the earliest days of our republic. And Prime Minister Modi would say, and I think this is a definition which a lot of our African countries and also the countries in the Gulf, Gulf would like to see, where he says, again, different kind of imagination and strategic geography, from the shores of Africa, not unlike the United States, where the Indo-Pacific starts from the west coast of the United States and ends at India-Pakistan border, which is the boundary now between Indo-Pacific Command and the Central Command, Prime Minister Modi is taking it further beyond it and say, from the shores of Africa to that of Americas, it stands for a free, open and inclusive region which embraces us all in common pursuit of progress and prosperity. There are many connectivity initiatives in the region. If these have to succeed, we must not only build infrastructure, we must also build bridges of trust. And for these initiatives must be based on respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, consultation, good governance, transparency, viability and sustainability. They must empower nations, not place them under impossible debt burden. They must promote trade and not strategic competition. Now my concluding statement is that when we talk about one belt, one road, say for example, there are a whole lot of questions which we never raise or seldom raise. How do we define connectivity? What about social connectivity? Is connectivity a goal or it's a medium to, to something? Or So I will not go into those. But my only one, one question which I have in mind is that when you use the word silk root or spice root, it is not just the invocation of the term, but it is also recollection or recall of the fact that the old silk roots had a very different ethos altogether. As pointed out by Peter Frankopin in his very majestic book, he said, two millennia ago, the webs of communities wove into each other to create a world that was complex, where tastes and ideas were shaped by products, artistic principles and influences, thousands of miles apart. This was a world that was connected, complex and hungry for exchange. Will China's Belt and Road Initiative follow the ethos of the old Silk Route is the question that I, I have in mind. So I think with, with that, I can just draw your attention. I will not go into the details of it. Is the new frontiers of China's economic engagements. And before that, one, one point which I want to highlight is that we should also talk about silences in China's economic engagements. And one of the great silence that I find is the ecological silence. In a lot of work that we are doing on Belt and Road, the social impacts and the ecological impacts of all these big projects have not been taken into consideration. And then I have always called India and China planetary powers because the, because the impact of what they do or what they do not do will have planetary impact. And my last is, is something which I'm working on right now and for a very long time, in fact, but, and that is the polar regions. Uh, when we talk about China's engagements, let us also go beyond the state-centric frames of international relations and look at something which is going to decide the future of humanity, global commons. Let us see how China is going to engage with the Antarctic, where uh, we see uh, claims and territorial claims we have uh, two Indian scientific stations. We have five Chinese stations. Chinese are building their second uh, polar ship. The Chinese engagement in the Arctic, as you will see in the, in the context of climate change, is also increasing. This is the Arctic paradox. The resources which are responsible for global warming are now becoming a catalyst for the new interest in the Arctic. China has come with its Arctic white paper.
And China, according to some scholars, would be very much interested in the uh, exploitation of resources in the poultry. I'm not saying China is the only country which is interested in doing so. But the point is that I would like to conclude my presentation by saying that uh, uh, we should also look at, in our discussions, about these new frontiers of China's engagement, which could even include the deep sea bed and the manganese nodules which are, which are lying there. So with these words, uh, thank you very much. And I'm very grateful, sir, for this honor that you have done to me. Thank you. Thank you. That was a complete master class in the evolution of these concepts and its continuing relevance today. And I think that question that you used, and I'm not even going to Arctic and Antarctic and the New Frontiers, on whether the rules of the game, which existed for millennia, and the word was very right, roots, not root. There's nothing called a root. It was a massive dense network. Whether the rules of the game would be the same, or would they become, to use a popular word, hegemonistic, you know? So that is obviously a good... I purposely did not send you a slip because it was such an enjoyable uh, class. We have to bring you... We have to actually bring you back here to actually give us... run us through the whole range someday, you know? I think it was really very educative. May now request Anand Krishna to speak. I'm not introducing anybody because it's all there in this, but he has lived and reported out of China for many, many years. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I agree. I think that was really fascinating um, and a really great academic perspective. Um, I am going to be giving uh, something slightly different. Um, unlike many of you here, I'm um, not an academic uh, or an economist. Uh, I'm a journalist, and I uh, was based in China until September of this year for nine years, where I reported um, on Beijing, uh, first for the Hindu newspaper and then for India Today. Um, so what I wanted to talk about uh, was something that I'm glad that uh, Mr. Sina mentioned in his opening remarks, which I think is a very uh, undiscussed aspect of China's external economic engagement, which is the role of uh, the Chinese private sector. Uh, and I think, as he very correctly pointed out, it's a very unique private sector, and I think we have to put private in quotes when we talk about uh, Chinese companies. Uh, but I think uh, when we speak about China's external economic engagement, I think the tendency uh, usually is to focus on what the Chinese government is doing uh, and what the Chinese state is doing. Uh, and we tend to look at major government-led initiatives. And I think uh, most attention now is captured by the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, which China has rebranded uh, to those of us overseas as the Belt and Road initiative to kind of convey something that's consensual, even though, interestingly, in Chinese, it's still the Ida Ilu, which is One Belt, One Road. Um, or what uh, Chinese large-scale uh, enterprises are doing uh, in terms of infrastructure projects, whether in Africa or in South Asia or Southeast Asia. Um, I think that uh, it's quite interesting that uh, if we look at China's big investors, uh, just to begin by looking at India, which I'll come back to in the end, uh, if you look at what China has been doing in India over the last two, three years, uh, a lot of the Chinese money that's uh, coming into India isn't actually coming in uh, from the Chinese government or from Chinese state-owned enterprises, uh, but it's coming in from uh, Chinese private companies. So uh, I think many of you here may be familiar with the Made in China 2025 plan, which uh, has gotten a lot of attention uh, in the media. Uh, I think the Made in China 2025 plan, uh, which is a plan to upgrade China's uh, economy and technological capacities, it coincides with what we can think of as a second wave of going out of Chinese companies. So if you uh, remember what Chinese going out is, is in the early 2000s, you had, uh, encouraged by the Chinese government, you had Chinese state-owned uh, companies that were going all over the world um, with the focus on acquiring natural resources. Uh, and this was more or less led by the state sector. I think this is very interesting and different because uh, the focus of the second wave uh, of going out is not about acquiring uh, resources, but it's about technology uh, and acquiring technology. And this is one of the key areas of focus uh, of the Made in China 2025 plan, which I think a lot of you will be aware is also at the, I think, is at the heart of the dispute between China and the U.S. It's not about trade. It's about 
uh, Ch China's move to position itself as a global leader in technology, which is what America is pushing back against, and which is why I personally believe that even though there's a temporary truce right now, I think there's a very fundamental conflict which isn't going to be um, easy to resolve. Um, I think if we begin by looking at the United States, uh, because the U.S. followed by Europe were actually the two areas of focus uh, of China's overseas uh, technological acquisitions. Again, here a lot of it has been done by Chinese private companies. Uh, in many cases, these are Chinese companies that aren't uh, based in the mainland, but they're registered in Hong Kong, in some cases in Singapore, and also by a number of uh, venture capital funds as well, which have often have very hazy ties uh, to the Chinese establishment. Um, I think some useful context would be to look at uh, what the changes are in the Chinese um, economy uh, that are driving uh, China's private sector companies uh, to go abroad. Are these strategic goals? Are these economic goals? Are these market-driven goals? I think in many cases it's a fusion of all three. Um, and it applies to India as well. And I think I'll conclude by asking uh, what the implications are of India uh, opening up its tech sector to China in such a big way in the last two, three years. And I find it fascinating that uh, looking at this development from Beijing, I found that there was very little debate in India about this, and I think we just sort of looked at it as a given of Chinese companies coming in and acquiring Indian companies. And there was almost no scrutiny, either in terms of uh, public debate or media coverage of it, or even in terms of how the government was regulating it, which I thought was quite interesting. And I think we should also ask uh, to what degree uh, we should be looking at the Chinese private sector as indeed a private sector uh, and what the complications are of, of that. Um, I think you're all aware of the efforts of China to rebalance its economy as it faces a number of economic challenges, um, primarily slowing growth, and the fact that its model, which so far has been reliant on uh, state investments as well as uh, on exports, is now perhaps running out of steam. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, as part of this rebalancing, we hear so much of this from uh, Chinese officials, uh, from Xi Jinping, but actually it's reliant very much not on the Chinese state, but on the Chinese private sector uh, and what the Chinese private sector can or cannot do. Um, but why do I uh, term this as a dilemma? Uh, recently, um, there's been a lot of concern among Chinese private uh, enterprises, uh, particularly under Xi Jinping's government, that uh, the Chinese government was restricting the independence and autonomy that the private sector kind of uh, enjoyed so far, even though it was very limited, and that Xi Jinping was promoting the state sector. I think if, you, uh, if any of you saw his speech from Tuesday, uh, where he was kind, kind of laying out his vision on the 40th anniversary of China's economic reforms, he did draw, if you, if you read between the lines, he drew some very important red lines in terms of what China would and would not reform. And I think one of, the, one of the points that he made implicit in his speech was, was, this, was the sacred space that China's state-owned enterprises in, uh, sort of enjoyed, which uh, for political reasons I think the party is very reluctant uh, to reform. But the view among uh, most economists that I interacted with uh, in Beijing is that China has to reform its state-owned enterprises and its financial sector if it really wants to transition uh, to an economy that's led by consumption and innovation and very different from the Chinese economy as we, as we know today. Uh, so this was something that uh, China's Vice Premier Liu He mentioned in kind of responding to this huge public anxiety in China on the future of the private sector. So he, he, he gave this very uh, unusual and rare p uh, press conference to kind of lay out uh, why the private sector was so important. And I think it's quite a, it's a useful rule of thumb uh, for us to remember even though it's it, it, it's somewhat crude, but the Chinese private sector accounts for 90% of all enterprises in China, 80% uh, of employment, 70% uh, of innovation, 60% of GDP, 50% of government tax revenue, but, which Liu didn't mention, only has 40% of access to resources, which is the dilemma. And I should add one more figure to that, which is uh, in 2017, according to the Chinese government, it also contributed to 60% of outbound investment. Uh, which, is, uh, which kind of shows how we need to broaden what we think of. Um, so where is this money uh, from the Chinese uh, private sector going, uh, and why are they uh, investing overseas? So uh, in many ways, a lot of parallels uh, with the American experience of dealing with this new phase of Chinese uh, companies uh, going abroad and what India has been dealing with. Uh, in America, it's, it's been uh, led by 
uh, China's big three tech companies, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, uh, known as BAT. Uh, and in India, it's been two of the, of the three, uh, Alibaba and Tencent, along with Xiaomi, uh, have been big, very prominent players uh, in India. In the U.S., these deals peaked uh, two years ago, or three years ago in 2015, uh, where they kind of uh, reached $10 billion in a single year. Uh, why now? A lot of it is because of changes in the Chinese economy that go back to 2009, uh, 2010, uh, when the tech wave in China really began to take off in a big way, uh, with, with the rise of apps like WeChat by Tencent and Alibaba's Taobao, which I'm sure some of you here are using. Um, so they have invested. This just isn't overseas. They are investing a lot in China as well. They're investing in Chinese companies, investing in Chinese startups. Uh, some of these investments are strategic. Some of them are purely just about uh, the fact that they have all this amount of money. They don't quite know what to do with it. They don't quite know where to invest. They're just throwing um, investments and hoping some of them will stick. But I think it's overseas where they really see a lot of potential for returns, both financially and strategically as well. Uh, one is about acquiring technology. Uh, I think that's evident in what they're doing in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe. I think that's less so in India because they frankly see India's space as being behind China's with good reason. Uh, and the second is about replicating the success uh, in the Indian market, which they see as perhaps the only other huge market besides China uh, where uh, they see a lot of potential. What they do is pretty simple. They buy into fast-growing young companies uh, in, in spaces such as artificial intelligence, uh, fintech, virtual reality, social media. Uh, it's, it's pretty diverse. Uh, in the U.S., they've acquired uh, stakes in some of the biggest tech companies in the U.S., uh, Snapchat, uh, the ride-sharing company Lyft, uh, virtual reality company Magic Leap. Um, and so I think they've uh, really, I think it's only since Donald Trump came, whatever you may think of him, that uh, there has been so much attention looking at is it only a good thing that all this Chinese money was coming in, which is what the thinking in Silicon Valley was. But I think he's really refocused the debate to looking at uh, concerns about this, which I'll speak about a little later. In India, as I just mentioned, the objectives are slightly different. It's not just about uh, technology. Uh, it's about getting access to the Indian market as well. Uh, and that's because at home, many of these companies see their returns as peaking uh, in the Chinese economy, so they need uh, new markets. And I think maybe one of the a new driving force might be the fact that they're coming under hostility in the West uh, with increasing scrutiny on acquisitions by Chinese companies, which hasn't happened in India so far. So looking at India, since 2015, we've seen a huge jump uh, in the Chinese money that's coming into India. It's very difficult to actually quantify this for several reasons. Um, according to the government of India's figures, 42% uh, of the money that's come in from the Invest India program, which the Narendra Modi government launched, is from China. Uh, and I think this may be a conservative estimate because this looks a lot at greenfield projects. Um, and I think according to uh, India, the FDI figures from China till date are $2 billion. Again, this focuses on greenfield. Uh, the Chinese government puts this figure at $8 billion. So There's a huge variance. Um, but I think complicating this is when I was looking at the FDI figures from India, uh, the two biggest sources of FDI into India are Mauritius and Singapore. Uh, and so it's impossible for us to know how much of where this money is coming from. Potentially, there could be Chinese companies uh, that are investing in India through Mauritius. Uh, some are investing through Singapore as well. So it's very difficult to know. But if you look at the spread, it's quite interesting. It's quite uh, diverse. I think e-commerce is, is, is leading it $3 billion. It's transportation, fintech, travel. Uh, so these have been some of the areas of interest. I think if, in 2017, if you just look at tech and pharma, uh, there, was five, uh, there was almost uh, $5 billion from China that came into India, in part because of one acquisition by the Chinese company Fosun of an Indian pharmaceutical company called Gland Pharma. Um, if you look at Alibaba's investments in India, which in, in some ways is leading it uh, since 2017, it's put in close to $2 billion in India. These are some of the investments, uh, $700 million into, into the parent company of PTM, um, Alibaba is now the single biggest shareholder of PTM. Uh, there's Snap Deals, Omato, Big Basket. These are some of the companies. If you look at Tencent, it's almost the same. It's another $2 billion from Tencent. Uh, $1 billion in Ola, $650 million in Flipkart. And these are uh, Hike, the Messenger app, and Practo in healthcare as well. Uh, Xiaomi has invested about $500 million as well, and their plans to double that slightly more diversified strategy where they're putting smaller amounts in, in a large number of companies.
Um, so what are the implications of, of, of this, this new phase of Chinese uh, economic engagement? Um, I think one of the interesting things is, uh, in large part, this has happened with very little to do, uh, uh, very little role for the Indian and Chinese governments. They actually haven't had much role to play in this money coming in, and especially with the Indian government. Um, and I think India's trade, and trade strategy with China has generally focused on two aspects. One is opening up the China market for Indian companies, like Indian IT companies, Indian pharma companies. And the second aspect is getting in Chinese investments into greenfield projects in India to manufacture in India and make in India. A lot of energy um, has been spent and currently is being spent on these two goals of India's trade strategy. But they've largely failed. Um, and covering this over the last four or five years, I would argue that it's unlikely to succeed uh, only because it doesn't suit the interests of China, which, especially if you look at IT, they don't want Indian IT companies to come to China and be successful. What they're doing is they want Chinese IT companies to learn from India and, and, and establish their own um, IT uh, strengths. So if you look at IT, it's quite interesting because the only Indian IT company that's been successful in China is, is NIIT. And that's because what NIIT is doing is it's training Chinese in, in learning IT software skills. So in some, can, in some sense, it's undercutting what, uh, what Infosys and Wipro and TCS are doing uh, because what it's doing is it's coming to Chinese companies and saying, well, you don't need these Indian companies. We'll just train uh, your people so you could build your own IT companies. But I think in contrast, there's been very little attention at the official level uh, when it comes to investments in tech because India's focus was on something else, uh, on greenfield projects. But I think that is changing, and now I think they're trying to catch on to this trend, and the Indian government has been sending uh, delegations of uh, tech companies to China seeking uh, Chinese money, uh, Chinese investment. But I think one question that hasn't been really asked is, is this sort of um, Chinese money com coming into India, is it an entirely good thing? Um, I think... Uh, for sure, uh, there, has, there have been benefits. Uh, the infusion of Chinese capital as well as Chinese uh, capabilities, it's allowed a lot of Indian startups, including Paytm, Ola, to scale up very fast thanks to financing. So I think it should be welcomed on one level. Uh, but I also think that there are a few wider, long, longer-term concerns of Chinese companies acquiring, controlling stakes in a lot of Indian companies uh, without any regulation. And I think it's a bit surprising that it hasn't come under that much scrutiny. So I, I, I'll just end by flagging three issues. Uh, one is data security. Two is how do we decide which companies are strategically sensitive uh, because this is definition is changing every day with technology. And three is how do we regulate this? Uh, I think the first one is somewhat straightforward, uh, though it's ignored. Um, I think if you look at uh, this Chinese company called UC Browser, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but it's the single biggest mobile browser in India, and it's used by about 400 million Indian people. And it's a Chinese company uh, that, w that was recently bought by Alibaba. Uh, and it has a tremendous market share in India. And it recently came to light that this company was uh, storing the data of, of Indian users in China, not in India. Um, and I think it's, it isn't easy, frankly, uh, to regulate this kind of um, acquisitions because um, our definitions are changing every day of what is sensitive and what isn't. Uh, for example, I'm sure we'd consider a bank to be a sensitive asset. But when an online wallet like Paytm is offering day by day the services of a bank, are we okay with the Chinese company being the majority shareholder in, in an Indian online wallet that's, that's used by half a billion people? And Alibaba, as we all know, has close ties to the Chinese state. Or uh, Chinese acquisitions in, in the media space in India, what are the implications of that? Uh, I think one of the big Chinese companies that's coming into India uh, is a company called ByteDance. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I, uh, there's an app that's very popular now called TikTok, which is a video sharing app. I don't know if any of you use it. Uh, it's a variant uh, of a Chinese video sharing app, and it's owned entirely by, by ByteDance. And they have, uh, this company, ByteDance, has, is, a, is a very big player in China in terms of news aggregation. And it has very close ties to the Chinese government as well. So it has a hugely popular app in China, uh, which when I was using, which gives you a very personalized news feed every day. Uh, called Jinru Totia. So it, it looks at your browsing history and what are the things you search for, and then it very, very smartly curates the kind of things that you want to know every morning. But it does also play a very, very important role in the Communist Party's uh, propaganda because it's, a, it's unlike Chinese uh, traditional media players like the People's Daily, which, frankly, no one young in China reads, only 
It's uh, Chinese government people and maybe Indian scholars who study the People's Daily. No one in China reads it. But, but why these kind of apps are so important is because young people are reading it. So what it does is it, it, it does select uh, what you want to read, but then it also gently puts into your feed things that the government wants to put out. And now this company, uh, ByteDance, it's, it's becoming a big player in, in, in the Indian news aggregation space as well. There's an Indian news aggregation app called Daily Hunt which some of you may be using, and, and ByteDance has put in $25 million in Daily Hunt. And it's a, I'm not saying that they're doing this with propaganda goals. I don't think that's the intent at all. I think they're doing it because they see it as a big, as a big market. But surely there are questions uh, to be asked uh, in terms of um, how we deal with this kind of investments. So uh, I'm not making the case. I don't think we should be alarmistic and, and suggest that every uh, investment that comes in from China is bad. Um, and I don't think this is about, this isn't an issue about China. I think it's about Indian policy making and how do we deal with this. And frankly, if we are going to single out Chinese companies, it wouldn't make any sense because many of these companies aren't registered in China anyway. Uh, I think the question is how do we regulate this uh, going forward? Uh, uh, one suggestion uh, that's often been made is, is something along the lines of what the U.S. has, is now, has had uh, a very toothless body in the past, which now has been reactivated by Trump, uh, called the CFIUS. The, the Committee on Foreign Investment of the United States, which, which is, which the aim of which is to protect American technology uh, from foreign governments. I think one reason why we haven't really regulated uh, this space is because we've kind of assumed that the, the Chinese private sector is, is entirely different from the Chinese state. Again, frankly, I don't know how, how valid that assumption is because the relationship between the Chinese private sector and state is something that's changing every day too, particularly under Xi Jinping, where the state is reasserting control uh, over private the companies as well. Again, this is an issue we have with all uh, companies, not just Chinese ones. Uh, we've opened up to Google and Facebook. Uh, and if you look at uh, the news that's coming out from the U.S., Facebook is far from transparent in terms of how it uses people's data. Uh, and they give backdoor access not just to the American government, but to American companies as well and make money off of it. And I think uh, it's a debate that we should be having in terms of China as well. I think I'll stop there, so maybe we can... If, if time permits, we can take some questions as well. Yeah. I think we will thank you, Anand. I think yeah. Thanks so much. But of course, very obviously that we are technology blind in our policies. So we have specific restrictions on foreign investment from China into India and from Pakistan. But we obviously don't take into account the technology sector and these companies which are not technically based out of the People's Republic. But yes, when people say Paytm is an Indian company, Actually, Airtel is also not an Indian company in that sense. Singtel is the largest single shareholder, you know. So in the new, this new world with the startups and these technology companies, their shareholding is so different from what we conceivably think of manufacturing that our policy is definitely behind the curve. And another rightly raised very serious issues about it, especially your browsing history, and which is why should we have data centers located in India? What are the pluses and benefits of it? And Government of India has been trying even for the other thing on uh, standards of the cell phones. But the companies have been pushing back, and therefore we're not able to really move on it. We are, I know, running behind time, but we can actually spend a little three, four, five minutes maybe. We have had two excellent presentations. Somebody really has very good, intelligent, smart questions, comments. It would be very, very nice, you know, because, as I said, two very, very thought-provoking, very, very different, of course, but I think both brought us a lot of very richness to the whole debate. And China is so important. Today, two-day seminar has just started in ICWA, where I was supposed to go also, India-China Think Tank Forum. I'm sure many of us were there, but no, I think I'm enjoying this really. I'm really enjoying it. Yes, sir. Yes. Just to comment to question what you have raised, like, and there's another section. Recently, China um, celebrated uh, 40 years of opening up its economy. That from a speech. Yeah, and... Uh, during initial days, China opened its economy for Japan, initial days. So Japan, anyway, it was an arcade meet that they used to call. But right now, the technologies which we could not get from the West, uh, maybe that we are getting from China, like mobile technology, if you see in 2001, 2002, 2003, like only like Korean or uh, uh, Swedish uh, mobiles were there in, here in India. But right now, since... Uh, uh, Japanese technology firms came and established their manufacturing plants. Later, Samsung declared establishing their large, huge plant here. We, are, we have now a set-top box plants, like we used to import initially. Uh, 
So I think that way, like we are getting some sort of technology in the, there is some sort of combination and Indian uh, manufacturers are entering into this competition and building this thing. So that's what I think. It's one of the aspects. respond to you. It's a uh, sir, my question is very simple. You know, uh, you have spoken splendidly on Chinese uh, various aspects. So my question to you is that China is trying to get to the best of technology from all over the world, whether it is Korea, India, you know, and Japan, you name it and they have it, Taiwan. But my question to you is, that the education system is the most paramount to get the innovation creep up in the nations. Korean is the best in the world in education this year. So my question to you is whether the Chinese have the best of education from the primary level to the highest level, if so, and are they able to do the innovation on their own, in time to come, in years to come. Thank you very much. Spoke about, uh, the Recording it and we are also on live just now. So, uh, sir, you spoke about how the geopolitics is uh, different, the classical and the critical geopolitics, and how the Western concepts have influenced uh, the current thinking. So in that sense, uh, do you, do you like, see how the China is going to offer a new narrative of geo-strategy uh, thinking, uh, which is significantly different from what Mackender and Mahan and others uh, spoke about? Or do you think that the Chinese will, uh, in their, one in their ec economic engagement and the other uh, strategic, strategic aspects, will follow what the West uh, eventually did? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, to, to your question, I think it's a good question, but I mean the question is are we really uh, absorbing technology from China? I don't think we are. Uh, I think the difference between what China did, which was to use its market as leverage and force technology transfers, which for reasons I don't know whether it's good or bad, we didn't do. Um, we are using Chinese mobile phones, but it's not that we have, I don't think, it's not, it's not that we have ma we've absorbed the technology in terms of our manufacturing capabilities, I don't think. Uh, in, in terms of education, I think that's a, that's a great point. I, I think they're really closing the gap. Maybe we overestimate the fact that, they, oh, they've now caught up with the U.S. I think if you've been to Chinese universities, I think there's a huge gap in terms of the U.S. in terms of attracting foreign talent, which they're struggling to do. Um, but at the same time, I think that... Uh, Frankly, we have to give them credit for uh, investing huge amounts of, in research. I think there are lots of studies that have come out in the U.S. in terms of uh, patents that have a number of patents made in China and the U.S. and the gap that's narrowing. So I'd say that they have had invested a lot. The gap is narrowing. They still have a lot to go, which is why they're so worried about this trade war, because they're still reliant on Western technology in many areas. Thank you. That was uh, an excellent question. Uh, as of now, I have seen uh, some scholarship coming from China on critical geopolitics. But what happens is also very interesting that how uh, the writings of Jared O'Toole, James Hedaway and others, John Agnew, how they are deployed to engage in a critique of the West, uh, particularly uh, the United States. So it's not just that only realists uh, are there in China. I mean, one also finds engagement with, uh, you have liberal uh, theories and, and constructivist approaches, but very small uh, as of now. Uh, I think with the passage of time, uh, I do expect that the school of thought will grow. Thank you. Quick, critic, just to add a few lines only. You know, at the stage when Nokia was making it, Nokia was the best in the world in India. The USA was using CMDA and not GSM, so, you know, there's no question of really American technology. And as he rightly said that how much of manufacturing is actually manufacturing? You know? The motherboard is not coming from here, right, as an example. Many other things. So it's not easy. The Chinese were able to leverage the market size very specifically. But their ability to control investment is quite different from our ability to control investments. So that is an issue. And the Chinese go and study in America a lot because there are lots and lots of Chinese in America and in the United Kingdom and Europe. Everywhere in the world you go, you'll find Chinese students. So they recognize the need to learn from outside very specifically. So 
No, 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 he's made the China point. I'm just adding the non-China part. But the China recognizes that despite all its advantages, the state needs to, you want to do hard sciences, you go to the United States of America, period, STEM. You go to the United States, in that sense, you know. So, but a little different. A little different. See, we, not just that, it is, you know, we think India and China is very similar. I can't think of two civilizational countries which are so dissimilar. To me, there's absolutely nothing similar between us. So, we are very nice. Let me thank both our... Of course, they're not going away. In fact, he, Professor Chaturvedi will now be chairing the first session, substantive session. I think we've had two really, really... And I've really enjoyed both of it, the 9 to 4 and the, you know... And the fact, how we don't realize how below the ground movements are taking place in terms of penetration of societies and markets, you know. And, of course, as I mentioned, so Chaturvedi is bringing down from the broad speak of geopolitics and geoeconomics to today and today's relevance and how does it factor in and looking forward to the other sectors that we don't really look at it today, India especially. We do not look at the Arctic and the Antarctic very seriously. We are observer status, I think, in one of them, but I'm not sure. I don't know. But in the sense that how you need to really be looking at in the fight for resources, may not be the fight for space anymore, but definitely the fight for resources, including intellectual resources. It's going to really become sharper and sharper. We need to prepare ourselves for it. Let's take a 10-minute. We're running behind time, but it's fine. I think the richness of the two debates has really added to it. So let's take a 10-minute break for tea, and then we'll start the first substantive session. This is very substantive, of course, but session number one, we call it. Thank you.